students that are chosen get to spend their summer doing research either up in the wet lab or in other labs, and they get $1,000 to do their research, um, as well as $1,000 to do the study time. So they consider it for all your students that are out there. And um, I'm really excited to, um, to see the work that Jewel and Uh, hi, my name is Noelle. And I'm Jewel. And we did our research on the concentration of chromium in popular liquid lipsticks. And we'd like to thank John Kay for this opportunity. So here's a basic outline of what we're going to be talking about today. First, we're going to talk about um, how chemicals in makeup are dangerous and just some basic facts about chromium. Then we're going to go on to our study and what we researched and found. And we're going to talk about the implications and what our results mean. So the average woman is exposed to about 168 chemicals from cosmetics. And the University of California, Berkeley, did an experiment on the chemicals in makeup in 2013, where they tested 32 different um, lipsticks and lip glosses for metals present. And they mostly focused on lead. And in their further research, they said that more research should be done into the concentration of chromium in cosmetics. So that's why we chose our topic. And then chromium is primarily found in makeup as a pigment called chromium oxide. As you can see, the green powder, it takes a green form, and it can also be created as a byproduct. So there are two different types of chromium, chromium-3 and chromium-6. Chromium-6 is a known carcinogen carcinogen, and it can cause lung cancer through inhalation, and also stomach tumors through digestion, which is why we wanted to focus on chromium, because in, li in lipsticks, you can um, digest some of the product on your lips. When in contact with the skin, the hexavalent form may cause ulcerations, dermatitis, and skin reactions, which is also why we wanted to focus on it, because it's on your lips. And some research has been done on the ingestion of hexavalent chromium in water. Um, and they have certain regulations on how much you're allowed to ingest. So we found out that the FDA has very um, lenient regulation on the manufacturing of um, the sale of cosmetics compared to European countries. Um, they only test certain batches, so not everything that goes on the market is tested. And in Europe, there is an article that prohibits the use in cosmetic products of substances classified as carcinogenic, mutagenic, or toxic for reproduction. So their standards are much higher in Europe. And the California Department of Public Health released the final hexavalent chromium drinking water standard of 10 parts per billion, although some scientists suggest that it should be 0 0.02 parts per billion, since this is such a toxic chemical. So knowing all of this information, we created a, a research um, project based on these. So we came up with four different research questions. Um, a broad one was, do liquid lipsticks contain chromium? And then we also decided to ask, does the chromium concentration vary by brand or by location of the product or by pr of production? And does the price of the liquid lipstick vary in chromium concentration? And also, does the color of the liquid lipstick vary the chromium concentration? So we would like to describe our process of digesting the samples. First, we weighed out the product, and it was between 0.1 and 0.4 grams. It didn't matter exactly how much we put, because we had to dehydrate it afterward overnight, which would um, change the weight anyway. And then after it's dehydrated, we added five milliliters of concentrated nitric acid and then put it on a hot block to digest at 150 degrees Celsius for about two hours. And then we added 25 milliliters of distilled water to the nitric acid and filtered it through the Wattman filter paper, which um, filtered into these tubes and then the substance left over was run through the ICP-OES spectrometer, 
which would be able to find out the concentration of different metals that we tested for specifically. So to answer our first question, if there's chromium concentration in liquid 66, we found out that there is chromium concentration. So this is just an overall um, of what we tested. So we had a variety of different liquid lipsticks. Some were like from the drugstore and some were higher end. And we also had products that were manufactured in different countries. And then we also tested for to see if color had an effect on it. And we kept all the brands the same for this test. So for our second question of is chromium concentration affected by the location of production, we found out that there is no statistical significance, but we, um, the EU has a lower variation on the chromium concentration. So we thought that was due to the stricter regulations because as you can see in the US and the China, the chromium concentrations vary like really largely. So, but the EU has a lower and small, um, like smaller concentrated data. And then we also wanted to determine if the price per milliliter had any effect on the chromium concentration. And we were expecting a negative slope where the higher the price, the lower the concentration due to like better manufacturing equipment and better materials used. But our data turned out that the price per milliliter isn't statistically significant, although it did have a slight downward trend. Um, for our fourth question of does color or pigmentation affect chromium concentration, we found that there is statistical significance so the reds and the lavenders have um, significantly more chromium concentration than pink, orange, and indigo. And going off of that, we grouped it into the tones of the colors. So we found that cool tone colors had a higher concentration than the warmer tone colors. And we classified the warm tones as the pinks and oranges and the cool tone as the red, indigo, and lavender. And red was classified with the cool tones because the particular red that we tested had a cooler undertone. So um, we found that there was a greater variation in the products produced in China and the US than the products produced in the EU. Like I said before, likely due to the stricter regulations in the EU. And we found that there was no significant correlation between the price and the chromium concentration but what we did find is that the cheaper lipsticks had a greater variation in chromium concentration than the more expensive products. So there was like more variation in the graph and the more expensive products had less variation and they, were, um, they had less chromium concentration. So we found that the color of the liquid lipstick did affect the chromium concentration. Uh, with lavender containing the highest, followed by red, indigo, orange, and pink, respectively. And that the warmer tones had a lower concentration than the cooler tones. So what does this mean for you as a buyer? Um, when buying lip liquid lipsticks, you should be wary of the color, but not so much as the price or where it was located. Although you should take in mind that with a larger sample size, it may be statistically significant. And we, you should try to stick to warmer tones such as nudes and pinks, which have a lower chromium concentration. Um, for further research, we want to determine the chromium, like the specific types of chromiums. So chromium-6, which if there's any presence of it, that it would be like very harmful. So the ICP OES wasn't able to test the types of chromium. It was only able to test overall chromium concentration. And we also should increase our sample size for the next test. So during this research process, we learned many things like how to solve problems quickly because 
originally when we came to the lab, we found out that Iolani didn't have the um, technology to help us and they didn't have a lot of the materials that we needed. So we were able to contact a professor at UH and he allowed us to use their laboratory for free. And he helped us digest the sample since we were using a concentrated nitric acid. And it was an overall good experience that allowed us to see all the hard work that goes into new research because there are no previous methods for you to work off of. You have to just use trial and error and you have to figure things out yourselves like based on what worked and what didn't work. And for anyone that wants to do this next year or like this coming summer, we recommend getting started early in the summer because problems that you can't foresee may arise. And if you do get finished early in the summer, then you'll have more time to work on your presentation and your paper and not have to stress about it during the school year, which is also what we recommend to do your paper during the summer. And then you also want to take as many trials as possible and like test as many samples as possible because that will help your data in the end to be um, more significant and you can actually come to better conclusions with the larger sample size. So we would like to thank our mentor, Dr. Ian Kusau, and also Dr. Chan for allowing us to have this opportunity. And we would like to give a special thanks to Professor Raymond Duchita and um, Robert Huang, who helped us to digest the samples at UH. Hi, my name is Arupa, and the project I did was on cloning the Zika NS5 gene. Um, so I wanted to thank um, my mentor, Dr. K, and um, Jack K, um, for giving me the opportunity to do this and um, for helping me along the way. Also, Dr. Kavi Neupane was my main mentor in walking me through the lab procedures for this. So the Zika virus, I'm sure everyone's heard of it because of the um, the cases of it recently where people had microcephaly and um, people were very negatively impacted, especially in South America. But um, the Zika virus actually in most cases isn't that severe. It only affects about one in five people and the symptoms are pretty mild like fever and rashes. Um, and also the symptoms pass within two to seven days. However, in the extreme cases where people experience microcephaly or Guillain-Barre syndrome, then the effects of Zika can be um, like very detrimental and can cause death. So it's important to figure out how we can treat this in those extreme cases, but currently there is no treatment or vaccine available. So my objective was to clone the Zika non-structural protein 5 gene which is located at the end of that diagram. And this protein plays a part in the replication of the virus. So if we can clone it and study it, then we can possibly figure out a way to stop it in its process and prevent the virus from being replicated. So it would just pass through your system and not really have an effect. So the main steps in my research was to first design primers which are little are short nucleotide sequences that can bind to DNA. And then when doing PCR, which is the next step, it can allow for that gene to be replicated. And then the next step was to get the gene into a plasmid so that bacteria could be transformed to have that gene. Um, and then I had to sequence the gene to make sure that it had all of the bases that I needed and to make sure that there were no major mutations that would affect the, um, the protein that would result from it. 
And then the final step was to analyze the protein that I got to figure out how it could be um, denatured or prevented from carrying out replication. So this is a schematic of the primers I designed. So um, the blue segment is the entire NS5 gene, and then those are the start and stop codons. So um, I had primers at the very ends, so NS5001F1 and NS52709R1. And I also had internal primers because my gene was so long that I might have had to replicate it in segments. And then once I had my primers, I could proceed to isolating the NS5 gene. So for that, I ran a PCR with my primers and my Zika template. And I ran the results on an agro shell to um, see the band size and to make sure it was the right band size. So as you can see, I have a band around the 3K mark, which is what I was expecting because my gene is 2,700 base pairs long. Um, so this is just an overview of how PCR actually works. Um, so you have your DNA sample, primers, nucleotides, the TAC polymerase, and the buffer. And those all get mixed together, and the tube gets put into this machine where the DNA is denatured so that the primers can fit in, and then the TAC polymerase can add in the nucleotides to finish replicating the strands. So once I had the correct insert, I had to get it into the bacteria vector. So for this, um, I used Gibson assembly, which uh, involves first cutting the plasmid so that it's linearized, and then um, cutting up the ends of the insert so that there are overhangs which can overlap with the plasmid um, and then allow it to be recircularized. Um, another method for um, getting the insert into a plasmid is topocloning, and this is specifically for mammalian vectors, whereas Gibson assembly is more for um, like bacteria. So this was necessary because the protein that I was looking at is post-translationally modified. So like the final product is slightly different in mammals than if it were to be produced in some other organism. And then the final step was to get the plasmids into the bacteria, um, which I did, and I ended up getting a bunch of different colonies. So to make sure that the correct insert was in the gene, I had to run a colony PCR, which basically involved re-isolating the insert to make sure that it was actually in the plasmid, because there was a slight chance that um, not all of the plasmids would have been cut properly, and then they would have gone into the bacteria without actually having the insert that I wanted. Then the next step was to send it for sequencing to make sure that there were no mutations that would affect the final shape of the protein and also to make sure that I had the full sequence. And unfortunately, I found that I only had the first 2100 base, pa base pairs. So this is a diagram of all the different sequencing reactions I sent in. And I found that at the end, the furthest I could go was 2100 base pairs. And I figured out that it was probably because my primers weren't specific enough to my strain of Zika. So when I initially designed them, I used the most widely accepted version of Zika, but that those had a few mutations from the one that I had, so it wouldn't bind in the correct place, and then I wasn't able to get the last 700 or so base pairs. So then I had to redesign primers um, that were targeted specifically to my strain, now that I had seen the sequence, and then basically repeat the same process again. So isolating the NS5 gene, um, doing Gibson assembly and transforming the bacteria, doing another colony PCR to make sure that the insert was in the bacteria, and then sending it for sequencing again. And I finally found that I had the full gene, all 2,700 base pairs, with no major mutation, so the final shape of the protein should have um, been what I expected. Unfortunately, by the time I got to this place, it was the end of the summer, and I <laughs> didn't have time to um, to analyze the actual protein. Uh, but it was still a really good experience because I learned a lot about microbiology techniques and the cloning techniques, um, and also the importance of perseverance because having to repeat the same experiment over and over with just slight modifications can become very frustrating. 
But when you finally get the result that you expect, then all the hours feel worth it. So for anyone that's considering doing it next year, I think that's the most important thing to know. And finally, I just wanted to thank, um, again, my mentor, Dr. Kabi Neokwane, and Dr. Helmut Kay, who helped me when um, Dr. Neokwane wasn't around, uh, Dr. Chan for mentoring me here, and um, the Kay Fellowship for giving me the resources and opportunity to do this project. Um, and also, finally, Jabsum, um, which is where I got the Zika template that I used for my PCR and where I would have gone to examine the protein if I had time. Thank you.